Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51 per cent, a show about women reshaping our world. In this special edition, we are focusing on reproductive health. Coming up, it's a social taboo. Very few people talk openly about it and yet around one in four women will experience a miscarriage. We'll be looking at how to end the stigma surrounding the issue. We'll also be asking Finnish journalist Pila Hintika, who's written a feminist guide to pregnancy, on why there is such a problem with people talking about their experiences. And the ongoing taboo of gynaecological abuse, with women now speaking out against procedures given to them without their consent. But first, a miscarriage is a dramatic event in a woman's life, and yet they are far more frequent than many think, for the simple reason that they're usually not talked about. Many women only discovering how common they are on the day they find out that they are having one. Why the silence and what are the consequences? Julia Guggenheim and Claire Pakalan have this report. Miscarriage. One in five women have had one or more. The French charity Agapa supports women and couples whose pregnancies have ended abruptly. Annie had two miscarriages in 2016. Free the voices of women who've experienced a miscarriage. That's what this support group hopes to achieve. It's so important to inform, but at the source, to talk, but even in the schools. We're taken by the hair because the life develops in us, but for society, it doesn't exist. A miscarriage is a significant, a miscarriage is a significant event for many women, but not always for the healthcare workers who see them every day. At the end, we would hear the heart. Why have these women not experienced more compassion? Insufficient training, lack of time and resources in hospitals. The head of this maternity ward in Paris says he's well aware there's a problem. Annoncé humainement une grossesse arrêtée à 4 heures du matin par un interne qui bosse comme un fou. On n'est pas beaucoup dans les hôpitaux et it's a real problem of formation. In France, if a fetus dies weighing more than 500 grams or after 20 weeks in the womb, parents can officially record a name and hold a funeral. But for pregnancies that end earlier, knowing if and how to grieve can be difficult. At the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, we meet a legal expert and blogger on pregnancy and childbirth. L'idée que les femmes ne doivent pas embêter les hommes avec des questions qui, qui renvoient, qui, qui dégradent leur image d'appât sexuel. Donc c'est l'idée, on ne parle pas des règles, on ne parle pas des pertes vaginales, on ne parle pas de la ménopause, on ne parle pas de, 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 de tout, toutes ces choses qui relèvent de l'intime des femmes. Even though they don't physically experience them, would-be fathers also suffer the emotional pain of miscarriages. Breaking the silence could help men and joining me now is Pilar Hintika, a Paris-based Finnish journalist and author of The Feminist Guide to Pregnancy, which has been published just in French for now. Pilar, thanks for your time. Why is it that society still refuses to talk openly about women's reproductive issues such as menstruation, menopause or miscarriage, as we saw in that report? Well, the medical and scientific world is still very much dominated by men, and there is a definite taboo around women's bodies. And this leads to the fact that we don't really pay enough attention nor take very seriously these experiences that are considered mainly feminine or happening to women. Like you said, periods, pregnancy, miscarriage, menopause, giving birth. And we lack a lot of information on the complexity of these experiences. And we tend to treat and talk about them uh, from purely physical and medical point of view, which excludes completely the psychological and cultural dimension linked to them. And the absence of knowledge maintains the feelings of guilt suffered by women, and especially those whose pregnancies, for example, don't go according to a plan, who have a miscarriage and don't know much about it, and finally end up having to deal with it very often, very alone, without the proper help and sensitive care.
So, as you say there, it is certainly important for women to grieve publicly. Yes, it is very important for uh, women to be able to express their feelings of grief uh, openly and uh, they should be met at the medical care as well. And the whole point is that uh, women should have the right uh, to have a freedom of choice of how they go through and how they live through these experiences. But the problem is that in France, uh, this uh, taboo of uh, a pregnancy is very much linked to uh, to the right for an abortion. And in the 70s, uh, French feminists fought very hard for women's right to not to have a baby, but by legalizing the abortion and contraception. And it is still a very important issue, as we can tell from what's happening in the world at the moment. But at the same time, we seem to have forgotten that there are also a lot of women who want to have babies and want to become mothers. And they also need feminist attention and information and support. And this challenge, uh, it's a challenge today uh, because according to the abortion law, uh, a fetus is considered to be nothing before 12 weeks and women doing an abortion and having a miscarriage should have the right to feel this way. Uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of women who experience feelings of grief, anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stress or even depression after a miscarriage. And they also should have the right to talk about it openly and their grief should be taken seriously. So what needs to be done to encourage women to do as such? Well, first of all, I think we need to change the attitude in the society in general. We need to talk more openly about uh, women's uh, uh, reproductive health issues in general. So the, we need to free the word <laughs> around it. And also men should get actively more involved and informed. And at the same time, we should invite them more to talk openly about uh, their own feelings as well. Uh, as we saw in the documentary as well, that we, we, we very often talk only about women's uh, grief when it comes to miscarriage, but a partner can also suffer from grief after miscarriage, which is something that we very rarely talk about. And quite often, uh, when the woman starts to feel better, it's the partner who's been supporting her collapse, co uh, who's, who's collapsing. And I think the key answer uh, is the dialogue and communication. But we also need to educate, of course, the medical staff in maternity wards. And that, of course, requires a lot of time and money, which is something that they don't always necessarily have. But it is very important to take the mental health conditions into consideration and have respect and a lot of empathy for each and everyone's experience of pregnancy and miscarriage. Pila Hentika, it's been great speaking to you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, gynaecological violence is the term used to describe abuse of women during pregnancy, childbirth and the postpartum period. It's long been trivialised or seen as a taboo, but more and more women have been speaking out about procedures given to them without their consent. This report by Natasha Milleray, Yong Chim and Catherine Kedia Clifford. Speculum. Speculum, a feminist show about taboos around gynaecology. Je vous félicite pour votre pilosité. Vous n'avez pas succombé au ticket de métro et au passage, très joli soutien-gorge. This may seem like an implausible conversation, but it's a little too close to reality for many women who have been victim to verbal and physical gynaecological abuse. Anya is one of them. She gave birth to her daughter Wendy in 2014. This is the first photo we took of her when she was just a few seconds old. I didn't even know that I'd had an episiotomy at that stage. An episiotomy is an incision in the area between the vagina and the anus at the time of childbirth. Anya did not give her consent for this surgical act to be carried out. It took her a while to fully realize what had happened, and medical staff didn't explain it to her at the time. I knew that when I went to the toilet, it hurt, that it hurt to sit down, but I was in total denial. It doesn't hurt, and there's no reason for me to have had an episiotomy. A month later, I went to see my midwife for physiotherapy, and she said to me, but there's a stitch too many. You have what's called the husband's stitch. This is the name of an extra stitch given to tighten the vagina for the increased pleasure of the male partner. For Anya, it marked the start of five years of suffering. It was a breach of trust by the doctor. It comes down to mutilation. It's a traumatic experience for many women. 
The episiotomy is often used to speed up births as a routine procedure rather than an essential one. It's still widely used in French maternity units at a rate of around 20% of births. Here in Nanterre, the figure is much lower, less than 0.3%. The head of the maternity service explains that the procedure is rarely necessary. We've learned that the few seconds we gain doesn't make much difference, and for the patient, it changes everything, because if they haven't had an episiotomy, it's sure that they'll be in less pain. In 2018, the High Gender Equality Council condemned the lack of information and options given to patients who are supposed to be guaranteed informed consent. And that's it for this edition. You can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that of course being France 24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.